So I'm going to welcome up to the stage our next presenters. We have um, Sydney Smith and Jason Helmlick are both PowerShell PMs. Uh, and of course, I think we all know the inventor of PowerShell, Mr. Jeffrey Snover. It is my great honor to welcome you to the PowerShell Summit. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun after, what has it been, about two plus years of living like Osama bin Laden, you know, <laughs> staying inside, trying to avoid being seen by anyone. Uh, we're out here in, in public seeing people. It's, it's really wonderful to see all these wonderful faces and to reconnect with old friends. Uh, PowerShell is a great community. Take advantage of the community, right? Really use this time to, like you see, you're gonna see a lot of great sessions, awesome, right? Make sure you connect with the speakers, make sure you connect with the uh, fellow attendees, because the real value of the summit is the networking, right? The, hey, I saw you gave a talk and had a question. Hey, I met you at the summit and you mentioned X, Y, or Z. Loved it. How did you do that, et cetera? That is the real um, the power of the summit. The summit is a gift that just keeps on giving if you do it right and you make connections, okay? so. I am Jeffrey Snover. I'm a Microsoft Technical Fellow, uh, and I'm also the CTO of our Modern Work Transformation. And I am joined today by superstar Jason Helmick. He is a PowerShell PM, a uh, long time, long time member of the community. Old, in fact. <laughs> Old member of the community. And then the young person, <laughs> Sydney Smith. Sydney, uh, yeah, there you go. Woo! Man, give it up. Uh, PowerShell PM. He hated being the drummer, by the way, because it's an old Spinal Tap thing. Yeah, exactly, Spinal Tap. You're on. Oh, is it my turn? Hey, look, look, look! Don't look at me. Look at the, look at the thing. Dude, 15 years of. <laughs> See, back when this first came out, back 15 years ago, nobody knew if it was going to make it to year two or year three. The fact that we're standing here 15 years later shows a couple of things. Yes, it shows Microsoft's commitment to PowerShell being a very important thing as far as Microsoft is concerned, but what it really shows, it shows you. It shows your work, your dedication, your driving, your help to the team, you've kept PowerShell here. So the round of applause isn't for us. Well, it is for him, since he invented it. But it's really for you. So give yourselves a huge round of applause for 15 years of PowerShell. Well, and, you know, and he is absolutely right. When PowerShell first came out, a lot of people were like, oh yeah, we know Microsoft and technology. They come out with something and then they you know, abandon it a couple years later. But it really was the response of the community that made them say, hey, this is pretty good. Let's keep investing and investing. So uh, your support has been what made PowerShell great. Awesome. Yeah, 15 years is amazing. Um, do you guys want to sing happy birthday with me? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear PowerShell. Happy birthday to you. That was not part of the plan. <laughs> Yeah, well, so we can jump in to the agenda from there. Um, for today's agenda, we wanted to focus a little bit more on the story that we're telling, the message we're kind of getting across, and let the technical details fill themselves in as we go. Um, so for starters, we want to recognize that the world is a messy place today, um, and that this isn't a new problem, that the world has always been a messy place, um, that in the past, 15 years ago, um, PowerShell helped by simplifying automation and that PowerShell continues to help by simplifying automation today. Um, it's been a while since we've seen a lot of you in person and a lot of life improving stuff has shipped since then. We wanna demo some of that for y'all. Um, and you guys have solved some amazing problems with it. Um, pandemics are messy and so PowerShell is as relevant as ever today. Um, and new features continue to ship um, to help with these shifting problems. 
So once again, we have missed you so much. Um, it was amazing when Jeffrey asked earlier uh, how many of you were first timers. Um, so we've really missed you um, getting to just see you in person for the first time today. Um, but it's so great to see a room full of folks excited about PowerShell. And so during that pandemic, here's all the kind of crazy things we did. Of course, let we, the pandemic itself has been a terrible thing. Let's just get that to the side. However, some things that we've try to do to keep ourselves going and that's we've we found all kinds of new ways to meet with each other right whether you're using teams or zoom or whatever but how do you like the new world of meeting okay that wasn't as enthusiastic but at least you can right yeah. right so we have all these crazy things to entertain us i'm really not so sure what the guy in the lion's doing but anyways all of the things that we did to entertain ourselves, and one of the things that was impacting me is that, you know, besides the pandemic and all the, the, the stuff going on with that and trying to put that to the side in order to look towards the future and to look, there's, there's so much stuff coming at us. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to keep my sights on the future and trying to get work done, but yet it's hard. Yeah, go ahead and if you well, want. By the way, if you don't know that, that's actually Jason's TikTok channel. It'll be... <laughs> It seems like every time, yeah, this was a cute little picture of, uh, this, this is what happens to me every morning. It's with this, all of this new stuff, right? I'm trying to, I want to get stuff done. I want to solve problems. I've got brand new problems because during this pandemic, technology didn't stop evolving. It didn't stop shipping. It didn't stop doing the things that it needs to do. As a matter of fact, it accelerated because of all of the challenges that we have. So I'm constantly looking out. There's new APIs, new interfaces, all of this stuff. And every time I turn around to try to do something, I'm stepping on a rake and smacking myself in the face going, maybe it's time for me to retire. I mean, it's just so complicated now. Don't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, this isn't such a new problem after all. Um, in the past, it's felt like, you know, getting a rake to the face every time you take a step with technology moving quickly. Um, new forms of communicating. We had the internet and email. Um, then came along smartphones and uh, new media changing all the time, and in fact, social media and new ways we were communicating there. And then the advent of things like the cloud, and all of a sudden we had something like Windows Azure to deal with. Um, so this is actually a familiar problem. Well, you know what the funny part about this slide is? Sydney put together this slide, because she's doing, you know, I'm doing the whole new thing, and she's like, well, you know, this is an old problem, you know, Sydney, the, the young one, all that kind of stuff. But here's the thing, she put this slide together, and you guys notice that that's an iPhone 1? All right, come on, PowerShell people. That's an iPhone 1. That was our biggest challenge when PowerShell came out, came out with Exchange 2007. The iPhone 1 was the first thing that many of us were doing with PowerShell, was enabling IMAP services on Exchange because those were disabled by default because they're bad, they're evil, right? So, I mean, this is our first experience. I thought that was great. She said, okay, you apparently aren't that impressed, but I was. <laughs> I'll, I'll shut up now. I'll give it back to an, a responsible person. Is it? Oh. Yeah. Oh, responsible. So, so oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to walk in front of you like that. So, <laughs> so many years ago, Jeffrey Snover made, made this comment. Learn PowerShell and we'll do everything we can to make it the best investment that you've ever made. This is referred to, we always refer to this as the sacred vow, right? This is, if you're willing to put up and learn this, we're going to work our butts off and make sure that it does what you need it to do. So if you're stepping on a rake, we're going to make that hurt a little bit less. You'll still step on it, but it'll hurt less, that kind of thing. This sacred vow is extraordinarily important, but you, we need to translate this into ways that we can do work. So I put up here, it isn't just a promise, it's our continued work effort. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to take you into how we think about this sacred vow and how we categorize and how we prioritize our work. And one of the advantages is, maybe you got a great idea for a uh, feature, or maybe you know about a bug or something. It helps to understand how we think about things. And what we really try to do is take those original beliefs that were written into PowerShell and evolve them and grow them. And that's, we'd like to take a few minutes and show you that. And Sydney, I think this really is coming up to you, but this is our opportunity to show you both what we've been thinking and show you a little bit of technology as we go along the way. I think the next slide's up for you. Oh, no, right. it's Jeffrey. Oh, 
There you go. Yeah, so uh, you know, if you have not had a chance to ever read the Monad Manifesto, I can highly recommend it. It's uh, links down here in the bottom. Uh, but it really did kind of lay out uh, the, the framework for PowerShell, the underlying principles, and explains a lot of what you see and experience as you, uh, it, you work with PowerShell. But in that document I wrote that you know, Monad, PowerShell, uh, leverages the .NET common runtime to provide powerful, consistent, intuitive, extensible, and useful set of tools that drive down the cost of administration and make life for non-programmers a lot easier. And so that was the gestalt of PowerShell. And what you'll see is over and over and over again how this kind of core idea then manifests itself in a set of PowerShell features, uh, the roadmap, et cetera. So really, we're gonna to talk to you about a bunch of details, but they're all really different representations of this core idea. Yeah, so, and I keep trying to hand my work off to you. It's just like being at the office. I, Sydney, <laughs> would you help me? Um, so here's the thing. The line that Jeffrey has in the original Monet Manifesto about making the lives of non-programmers easier, that's very important to us, but this is a sign of the evolution. Things have changed, things have evolved. A lot of IT admins, they started out as non-programmers, they now consider themselves programmers or developers. We have people in DevOps that are developers. We have people that their career, the, 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 the title that they have is a developer. And they use PowerShell to glue together the operations that they're doing in order to release their products and all that. So our audience is more than non-programmers. We haven't forgot about them, but we're talking about improving the lives of everyone that needs to do operation tasks. And that's a much more inclusive and much more helpful to everyone because everyone's got great ideas. And so the more ideas we have together, the better product we can make, and it can better serve everyone. And we'd like to actually break some of this down for you. I think now's when it becomes. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so when we talk about the purpose of PowerShell Division, we talk about improving the lives of folks working on operations by simplifying automation. And so I want to dig into a few key words here and talk a little bit more about what we mean. So when we talk about improving the lives, we mean we have genuine empathy for our users. Um, we acknowledge that the world is continuously changing and that we hope that PowerShell should actually relieve this frustration as the world continues to change. When we talk about folks working on operations, um, Jason and Jeffrey gave a great history on sort of the evolution of the way PowerShell viewed um, its audience. Um, and we know that today, PowerShell users solve really diverse and really interesting problems. And that PowerShell is for everyone who does operations. Um, we also really center PowerShell on the users and the problems that you all are able to solve. And finally, we think about simplifying automation and hope that PowerShell can relieve fear over unfamiliar technology because the learning process um, and the discovery process of new types of automation is consistent with the past. And we hope that PowerShell continues to evolve with its community, um, really tying into that sacred vow. Right, so if we think about, again, this kind of concept of improving the lives of uh, people working on operations by simplifying automation, that really translates into the pillars that we do our planning for our feature work. So, number one, we want to be able to welcome diverse new use, use cases and new users, right? So PowerShell be, should be, make it more valuable, over, make you more valuable over time. And I gotta tell you, it's one of my favorite parts of coming to PowerShell conferences is to talk to individuals who have picked up PowerShell and it has transformed their careers, getting them new, you know, making them the hero of their company and making them transformative in their company and then being rewarded either by their company being recognized or by other companies. And the other companies saying, wow, I will pay you a lot more money to do that here at my my." company. So that's why we invest in um, diverse new uses and users of PowerShell. There you go. The next theme is this idea of reducing the friction for users adopting new technologies, right? This is this idea of the world 
was, is, and always will be a messy place. There was one point in time we thought, hey, through the use of the common engineering criteria, we will get everyone to write PowerShell commandlets. Um, and we did for a while, and now it's one of those like, hey, listen to your users, do whatever you want. And as various teams listen to the users, some of the use user bases are saying, hey, we want PowerShell. Others are saying, talking to them about this feature or that feature. And so they haven't heard the message that uh, PowerShell's needed, and so they're free to not support it. So then if they don't support it, what is the answer? And the answer is, well, PowerShell can allow you to adopt those technologies even if the developers don't do so. Yep, so we invest in reducing friction for users adopting new technologies. And we'll show some examples of that ex uh, specifically today. Then we want to build on our legacy of customer trust, right? When you do, uh, when you do things that impact, at scale, uh, mistakes really matter, right? So we want to be able to create a world where it's safe for you to operate, to change, uh, et cetera. Yeah, so as we're welcoming diverse new uses and working to reduce friction for adopters, adopters, um, adopting new technology. <laughs> Guess that works as well. Um, we do really focus on building on that legacy of customer trust and really keeping that in the forefront. And lastly, and this is where we have spent a lot of time over the last, well, I'm terrible with years, so it's at least months, but probably like many years. No, this idea of uh, being able to engineer for agility, engineer for our ability to be agile, uh, refactoring the code base and our processes so that more and more teams can participate, uh, creating swim lanes of innovation so that the community can participate, you know, really just engineering for going faster and delivering more. Yeah, absolutely. So we have really focused over the last few years on building our engineering processes around this agility. Um, you'll remember back in the Windows PowerShell days, we had a release cadence of about once every three years. Um, and you'll see on the next slide that that is not the case today. Um, we'll also be talking definitely more around this theme in our tooling session. So quick plug for that on, on Wednesday. But these are all just talking points, right? But what you guys care about is what we've actually shipped, what we mean behind this, what we've been up to. Um, so I'm going to pause on this slide for a second and just let this sink in. Um, a few of the amazing things that we have shipped over the last three years. Um, feel free to take a picture of this if you want to be able to go back and reference it. We don't have time today to kind of dig into every single feature item on here. Um, but there are amazing blog posts, um, videos. I'm sure you'll hear stuff about this across the session. But this is just a sampling of the things we have shipped since we last saw you at PowerShell Summit in 2019. And one thing I really want to highlight here is in the bottom corner, you can see where we talked about engineering for agility. Since we last saw you guys in April of 2019, we have had 60 releases of PowerShell across <laughs> Preview and Stable. Yeah, I'm really uh, excited by this slide because it won. It breaks things down by our, uh, our key initiatives, uh, but then also just the volume of innovation. And by the way, this is not, not, not what the PowerShell team's done. This is what the PowerShell community has done. Many of these uh, things have contributions from the community. We would not have been able to do this with just the PowerShell team alone, so it, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, absolutely that, and just the amount of feedback we've gotten um, across all of these releases. Um, we talked about if we broke this up into you know, preview releases, we'd have many, 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 maybe 10 times the slides. And that's a huge testament to our community um, and the ways in which you have really engaged with us in the open source um, world and given us the feedback across those releases to kind of make, make these things happen. But with that, I think I'm going to introduce our next rock star up onto the stage. We have the one and only. Danny Martins, PowerShell Ooh. PM. <laughs> Danny is an awesome. Yeah, Danny is an awesome PM on our team, and he focuses a lot of his efforts around Cloud Shell and OpenSSH. So um, I will pass things right over to him. Cool. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, yes. Hi, folks. I'm Danny Martins. Uh, as Sydney mentioned, the PM for uh, Azure Cloud Shell and OpenSSH, and kind of some various other SSH-related projects. But I, I think we're going to go into a little bit of our demos of these items. So I think. Jess, no, 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 no. Well, am I going first? Yes, you're, you're, Lucky me. You're the first guy. Up. How are we going to awesome. do this? Are we going to hold this? That would there you be go. lovely. Thank you. So. 
You know, if I knew that I'd have my t a technical fellow holding the mic for me today, I would have. I know, right? Whatever helps, man. Whatever helps. All right. So forgive me since I'm waiting on Jason's computer. One second. All right. So once the portal loads here, I can. So you start typing, man. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think I even need to type, and that's kind of the point of what I'm going to show today. Oh. So uh, we've done a lot of improvements to Cloud Shell over the past three years. A lot of those have been behind the scenes, and what we're looking at enabling is using Cloud Shell as a tool for both learning uh, new, uh, new commands, uh, new functionality within the, uh, the portal, whether that be uh, ease of use or one-click en enablement of features, and we're still loading, so I'm gonna stall us a little bit more. It's the ghost of Joey. That's right. <laughs> Sad Joey. There we go. Maybe not. Yeah, I gotta say, I... I yeah. Great. So, I'm going to, and Jason, you might have to come help me because I don't know where you put this virtual machine for me. We're gonna get there. 26, thank you. Maybe you should come out of the dark. Out of dark mode. Yeah, well. We'll, we'll get there. All right. So I've navigated to our virtual machine just to show one of the features that we've worked on with Cloud Shell. It's actually been a, a really large focus us, for us over the past six months. And we'll be lighting up a lot more scenarios that are very similar to this in the future. Uh, but. Uh, you're all familiar with, you have different resources uh, that you can view in Azure, whether that be virtual machines, networking, storage, et cetera. Um, and one of the feedback, pieces of feedback we hear quite often is, great, I know how to do things in the portal, but how do I transition from a portal view into a more automated uh, workflow, whether that be Azure CLI or Azure PowerShell? And so one of the features we've lit up here, and it's just not shown just because the monitor is not wide enough, is this uh, Azure CLI, Azure uh, PowerShell tab, and so if we click on this for this specific resource, you're going to you're going to see different commands that are executable on that resource. And so for today, I'm just showing the the Azure CLI, just because we're in the process of rolling out this feature for Azure PowerShell, but we don't quite have it quite yet. Um, but if I click on the Azure CLI, we have this Try It button, right? And so this enables a one-click uh, execution of that command that's specific for this resource in Cloud Shell. Wow. And so we have things like uh, Azure VM Start, uh, uh, Azure VM List, things that are disruptive like Stop. We don't give you that option because we don't want people just po poking around in the portal saying, hey, I can stop this VM, click, and breaking everything. So if I go back to this Start and I just click Try It, uh, it will open Cloud Shell. Um, and through the slow internet. With we'll PowerShell, see. you could just add minus what if. That's right. There we go. Uh, and so this will open Cloud Shell, and it will automatically uh, buffer and execute this command on behalf of the user. And so this is executing on behalf of Jason. And so we can see that it has done the AZVM start. It is, it is now running uh, on behalf of Jason in Cloud Shell. And then we'll be done. Cool. And so the, kind of the great thing is we're doing this for both commands and then also for connectivity. And so look forward for with, open, with SSH in the future, you will have one click connection to any of your machines that are visible in Azure. So that's either your Azure VMs or your Arc enabled servers. And so if you want to learn more about that, uh, come to my session today at 3, 3.15, somewhere in there. Fantastic. And I'll pass it off to his next. Yeah, I love the fact that, uh, yeah. I love the fact that it was specific to that resource, so it's not just a generic example that then you have to go find your, the GUID and plug it in. It's right there, just copy and paste. There we go, thank you, Jason, <laughs> getting me in the right place. Um, so I wanna show you guys a little bit about error views and some of the updates we made to error view back in PowerShell 7. I'm, oh, oh, thank you, Jeffrey. Alrighty, so many of you are probably familiar that in PowerShell you have error views. Oops. Oh no. Let's try that again. <laughs> Air view. Awesome, there you go. So you can see that in Windows PowerShell we have normal views. So if I do something like um, get child item with a path, 
and I put in a wrong path that's not there. I get this block of red. Um, I can sort of parse through and see what's going on here, but it's, it's not exactly super intuitive and clear to me. Similarly, like say I um, do a, a cardinal sin and put an S at the end of my parameter, um, wrong parameter, I'm gonna get a similar error. Once again, screen full of red. So what we've done in PowerShell 7 is we've introduced a new error view. Let's try that again, a new error view. Awesome, called concise view. And so this is gonna give me a really nice um, one-liner when I have that error. So like, let's try this again, get child item, I have a bad path. Quick, simple message, um, a parameter cannot be found that matches the parameter name paths. Um, similarly, let's try that one, and we can see um, the same error, much more clear, easy to kind of see what's going on. Similar thing is gonna happen with a runtime error, get this kind of block, and we're gonna have a much nicer little experience here. Now, if you want a little bit more information than this, and you say the concise view, this is great, but I kind of need to look more into the error, well, good news, because we also introduced a commandlet called get error that's gonna provide you with the full error information. Um, this also has a nice parameter called newest, so say I want the last three errors, I can also pull that. Um, you can see the nice coloring here, um, much easier to kind of read and understand what's going on. So this is great and all. Um, if you're doing sort of interactive experience, working at the command line. Um, and now, let's see what it's like running a script. So if I have this script with a bunch of errors in it, I try and run it, oh, big old screen of red text. Can try and figure out what's going on here, but once again, not so intuitive. Um, let's try running the same script over here in PowerShell 7 with the concise view. And we can see this nice coloring. I can see I have errors on line 3, 5, 8, 10, and 12. I can see exactly what the error is. And then what I like to do from there is just code, multi-error, um, PS1, pop it open in code. I know exactly where my errors are, and I can um, get to fixing them. So check out the new error views in PowerShell 7. Um, there you go, and then from there, I'll pass it on to Jason. Oh. I can also take over Michael. Oh, oh, he's got a pocket. Oh. I have no idea how well this is gonna work, but we're gonna try it and see what happens. Captain Innovation. <laughs> <laughs> Swim lanes of innovation. Hey, by the way, this cool air view, Steve worked really hard on this. Yes, we, we took some ideas from some other, you know, like Rust and things like that, but we hope that this is a lot more helpful. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to show you, and I forgot what I'm demoing, so I'll just wing it. Um, first of all, the, um, wee, that needs to be bigger. That needs to be bigger. Hey, um, have you guys, uh, let's go to, uh, um, you, oh, yep, am I where, where I want to be? Oh, yeah, thank you. Hey, are you noticing I'm, I'm using Predictive IntelliSense. Hey, have you guys seen PS Readline Predictive IntelliSense? I mean, it's, I just have it turned on. You're gonna see us use this throughout our demos and stuff like that. So when I start typing, notice how it's like finishing my thought for me. In this case, it's saying, oh, you want that subsystem? Well, I actually did want that subsystem because I was talking about predictors and this is a new subsystem that has the predictors that you were registered. Come on, that's kind of cool, right? That is cool. I mean, so here's the idea. Um, if I do a set, if you download PS Readline, the new one, 2.2, and you go in and you set PS Readline prediction source history, you too will get your history predicted to you as you type. What we found Ooh. is, um, so here's the idea. You can have your history, what we found is this. This really helps you accelerate if you've already been successful once before. Right? If you've done it before, this will bring it back up for you. All of my git commands, all of that stuff that I just have to keep doing over and over again, this really accelerates me. But the other thing that I want you to know is this, and you'll see more about this in the session on Wednesday, our tooling session, um, is that uh, I just did it, uh, git ps subsystem. There are more predictors that are available, and we'll talk more about that later today, uh, later in this session and stuff like that. These predictors may help you do new things for the first time, such as the AZ tools predictor that helps you with Azure commands. Maybe you're not accustomed to creating a VM in Azure. Maybe you don't know you need a resource group before you make the VM, but that's okay. Just start typing new VM and it'll help you 
by predicting everything that you need to get it done. So even if you don't know what you're doing, it can help you. Is that helpful? Yeah. Kind of cool? Dongbo, um, Dongbo Wang is the primary engineer on PS Readline, and he worked really hard on this, and it's, it's pretty cool stuff. So stop by, talk to us, we'll show you more about it, that kind of thing. We'll, you'll talk more about it in our tooling session. Something else I wanted to show you. No, it's okay, it's, it's, it's okay, it's all good. Because um, I figure I'll screw it up no matter what I do. What am I doing, for each? Okay, so one of the other things that we did. Did you do the F2 list view? Oh, I didn't do F2 list view, thanks man. So let me show you. Um, one of the other things is, let me type in something that I might have more of. Um, F1, or what, this is what we call inline view. It gives you a prediction in a single line as a kind of a ghost thing as you're typing. But if you press F2, you get a list. Ooh. And you can, oh come on. So as I'm typing, this list will change. So if I'm typing something like I'm doing uh, get, See, there's my git commands that I, yeah? Ooh. Oh, come on, that's cool. <laughs> All right, so let me do this. Um, how many of you uh, use for each? Wait, did you do F1? Yeah, I did. Oh, I didn't do F1. I got to go back and do F1. So let me show you. I, I can't believe this. this is, so let me show you. Get child item. Hey, hi, I need help on this commandlet. How do you get help on the commandlet? Hit F1. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> While you're typing, just hit F1. Wait. When you hit Q, it goes back to where you were. Ooh. Wait, 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 wait. I need a parameter, and it's a parameter path. I don't know what that means. Hit F1. It'll take you right to that parameter. Ooh. Hit Q. You don't lose where you're at in your work. Remember, you old timers, remember how we always would bring up two PowerShell sessions? One to work in, one to develop in? <laughs> All right. Is there control else A. I missed? Oh, control. Oh, I'll see if you didn't get that one this afternoon. So here we go. Um, so for each, for each object, when you're doing work, it's easy to use for each. It's easy to use for each to iterate through a list. However, for each iterates fast, and you can do things fast with for each. But man, when I'm deploying software, or better yet, when I'm trying to scan log files for events, and I want to scan a thousand computers for a particular event, I'm going to wait a long time for that. So what we did is, is in PowerShell, was it 7.0 or 7.1 is when we first 7.0. did it? 7.0? Yeah. And we've, we've enhanced this since. You now have for each dash object with a dash parallel switch on it. So if you just take a look at the quick code here. I'll just kind of show this to you real quick. So, over here. So, I know it's just a little piece of code. The only thing I wanted to show you here, I'm going to run it real quick, and it's not going to be that exciting because it's just, uh, hell, I'll just start it now and just let it do its thing. Because it's not that exciting. It's just going to go do its thing. But here's what it's. <laughs> Here's what it's actually doing. It's doing it in parallel. So if I'm doing a thousand machines, I can do the thousand machines all at once, or I can control it with a throttle limit. Because I want you to think about this. We gave you for each parallel, which means you've got a lot of power now. I want to deploy some software to a thousand machines. What do you think that's going to do to your network bandwidth? OK, so test before you deploy. With in great scale. power comes great responsibility. <laughs> comes great responsibility. So here's the thing. When it comes back to our themes of the world is a messy place, I need to get stuff done sooner, I need to do stuff quicker, that's what we're thinking about. So how do we help you? Hey, how about you go to be able to do your stuff in parallel with parallelism and be able to just get it all done quicker? Mm. But understand that responsibility that you have. So 
for each is one of the, the things that we wanted to show you. See, we had this nice list of some of the things that we wanted to show you real quick from the past. Something else that I wanted to show you was, um, how many of you remember this? Oh, yeah. Ooh. Now, I don't know about you, but I love this. I do. Um, but we enhanced this. Well, changed it. To... Oh, come on. When you get down, <laughs> do you want half your screen taken up or do you want this little? I, Steve worked hard on this. This is something that we all care about. This is... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right. Now it's my turn. You get to hold this now. Okay. So, progress bar. Happy days, right? Hey, remember this. Remember this. Do things like, uh, dir. And look at that. Look at that. Mo, da, da, da. But now look what happens when I do dir here. Color. Color. Okay. PS style. Have anybody played with PS style? Oop. Dollar PS style. Style. Okay, so PS style is a, is a new automatic parameter. It's always there, and it's used for lots of different things. So go have fun exploring with this thing. Notice here it's got the colors, okay? And then if we, how about to use a Mac? <laughs> what the hell? How do I scroll up, my friend? It's not touch screen. It's not touch. It's okay, a, well, tell me how to do it. Well, go ahead and scroll it's, up. It's a cheap Apple. It's, a, it's, it's there you go. Okay, so now, two stop. Fingers. Two, fingers. two fingers? Okay, so then, look here, you got formatting, table header, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is tell it PS style dot formatting, formatting dot table, table header equals, now I can give some funky color, right? Like, uh, what the hell, dot E dash 42M, is that right? Oh, I think that's, that's a real thing. Oh, we'll do, what the hell is that, 106? Remember I mentioned people are screwing, gonna screw up their demos and do it again, Dur. Okay, ooh, ugly, right? Or what I could do is to say, right, but who's got ever gonna remember that, right? So then what you do is PS style, PS style dot background dot red. Ta-da, okay? So very, very nice. Now, script. <laughs> well, actually I showed that one. Yeah, I showed that, so there you go. Uh, now, oh, here's what I wanna show you. To use this, zero, zero, hello world, one, F. Okay, hello world. Now, if I change this first to dollar PS style dot foreground dot red, okay? Now, notice it changed, but then everything else has changed, right? So, you know, hello world changed, but then look, my prompt has also changed. So when you set, when you admit, what's happening is these are, are uh, representations of ASCII modes Right, ASCII uh, things that ASCII sequences that change the mode of the console. So notice I changed the text red, and then and then the prompt turned red. And if I, I do anything else, uh, well, let's see, test. Notice it's going to be red too. So what you have to do if you're going to use this stuff is learn about PS style. Dot. Reset. Okay. So now notice it changes it but then resets back to the way it was. Happy days, Thank okay? You. That's cool, I didn't, I, yeah. You didn't Thank know you. that, okay. Yeah. Now, remember, we showed that progress bar, if you recall. Progress bar, happy days. Now, notice I can say, dollar PS style, dot progress, progress dot style style 
Yeah, exactly. What the heck? Is it? Oh, I heard that. There you go. And now you can't see that, but it's changed. There you go. Okay, so that's PS style. Lots of fun. And uh, go explore that uh, dollar PS style. There's a lot more there. Um, and that's the thing. Just go explore and uh, have some fun. Anyway. Thank you. Alrighty, so that's a little taste of what we've been up to, of course, with the community support. But we also wanted to share a little bit about what y'all have been up to the last few years. All right, so what have you been up to? Now, we have been gathering telemetry. As you know, we are very, very hardcore about respecting privacy. Uh, so happy days, that's exactly the right thing to do. Ramification of that is we get telemetry, we don't always know what it does, right? So it kind of gives us a directionally. But directionally, this is showing you PowerShell 7 monthly sessions. Okay, so this is starting in uh, November of 2020. Uh, and it rapidly rose to 130 million monthly sessions. Then there was a bit of a dip. Again, we don't know. We've, we have the hypothesis that maybe somebody turned off telemetry. Customers have the option to do that. Competitors have the option to do that to us. Uh, but then we see a quick ramp up to almost 370 million by September. And then, boom, right? So now, one year later, right, one year later, uh, so one year ago, it was about 130 million. Now it is 540 million, 4X uh, increase in monthly sessions in a single year. And you'll notice here that uh, in the past when we talked about these, what we had seen was actually PowerShell core usage. Well, sorry, there was PowerShell core, and we used to report about PowerShell core, and it was largely Unix, uh, Linux use. Uh, now that it's PowerShell, you see uh, really heavy Windows use as well. And so now we believe that this is telling us that indeed PowerShell 7 is the version of PowerShell that everybody can converge on for both Linux and Windows. In the past, PowerShell Core was a little less than Windows PowerShell, et cetera. We believe now the evidence is showing that uh, for most people, it is meeting their needs. So what have you been up to? We've had over 17 trillion commandlets that got run in 2021. Uh, Three billion downloads from the PowerShell gallery since uh, spring. Yeah, billion with the B. That's just crazy. I had no idea that the PowerShell gallery was going to be that successful. Uh, 400 million unique instances of PowerShell 7 in 2021. Now, 64% of them have been Unix. Oh, wait, sorry. So when we say unique instances, um, we don't always know uh, when something's being run on a machine versus a Docker container, et cetera. So that's why we talk about instances versus machines or nodes. 2.5 billion starts of PowerShell, and over 350,000 monthly users of the PowerShell extension for VS Code. So, you know, 10% of them are using Mac. So, quite a lot of usage out there. Yeah, that is that is just amazing, and we are not stopping there. Um, we have a bit of a parallel slide with our our sort of fourth themes that we're continuing to invest in. And here you'll see our list of investments for the next year from the PowerShell team. Um, I think we, if we had time, we'd love to dig into all of these. So feel free to grab any of us um, the rest of the week and ask us what we're most excited about um, on this list. Um, but if you were hoping that this session was a rundown of all of these things of what's coming next, I have good news for you. And that is that we have a blog post that gives a short summary of all of these. And then in our March community call, we also brought on the dev owner for each of these areas um, to give a little blurb about what they're working on. Um, if you're also excited about these things, I will always plug to check them out um, in our 98 GitHub repos that are active <laughs> right now. So um, we hope to see you there. And with that, I think I pass things back to Jason. All righty, here we go. All right, folks, so here's the deal. We're going to do a cute little demo. I don't know if the demo's going to work or not. I don't know if the demo's going to work or not, but don't leave until you've seen the thank you. Okay. Understood? Here's the idea. What we wanted to show you was a combination of things. First of all, 
We're talking about a lot of technology. So this morning we can't talk about all of it in detail. We want to give you a quick view of seeing some of it in operation. The idea, this is how you get to see how we work. This is how we do things. And it also gives you an opportunity to see how we use our own technology. So just kind of how we take our bits and pieces and solve problems. Thought it'd be kind of fun. So here's the idea. We're going to be working cross-platform between you know, Linux and, and Windows. And I've got two VMs that are set up. And we're going to try to solve a business problem. Bob has a problem. Bob's problem is, is that he needs to run some commands in automation to make some changes. Actually, what Bob needs to do is alter the firewall. So Bob needs to alter the firewall. And so what Bob's going to do is Bob would really love to use NetSH. How many of you have used NetSH? How many of you like using NetSH? I There's would have expected Sean to put oh. his hand up. Wait, another guy did? Are you yeah. serious? Yeah, wow. um, at any rate, NetSH is a bear to use. So what we really want to do is we want Bob to be able to turn that or that, the little line down there, into just a simple command line. And we want him to be able to do it really easily and deploy it out to all of his servers to execute his stuff. Does it make sense? So here's what we're going to do. I'll start off with this little, little dude. Thank you, sir. And give me a second to figure out where I am. That's not where I want to be. Just to re-articulate, right? So NetSH, you know, who can remember that, right? And so what we want to do is we, you learn PowerShell. You learn a set of verbs. You learn a syntax. And then you predict. You make guesses. And, you know, about 70% of the time, you're going to be right with those guesses. So how do we take this world? And by the way, so we had, in the past, we had this world of APIs, WMI, and this, and this, and this. And we transcoded that into a well-defined set of uh, PowerShell commandlets. And here you're going to see how you can do exactly that with existing commands. So we don't care. We don't care whether the commandlet is implemented in .NET, in, Power, in a PowerShell script, in native code, in WMI, in some REST API, or through some other executable. We don't really care about that. What we care about is giving you a consistent command line experience with coherent uh, semantics and predictable uh, syntax. So ladies and gentlemen, as Jeffrey mentioned earlier, a lot of companies, not just Microsoft, but a lot of teams when they're developing, they need to get functionality out quickly and they need to serve their customers. So a lot of commands come out not as commandlets. That takes an, a lot more development time. A lot of commands just come out as what I call native commands, platform-specific command line tools. Are you with me? Yes? Yeah, go like this. Okay, so here's the thing. Not everybody does those anymore, but you can. And so I'm going to use a product that we, we just uh, uh, released recently called Crescendo to basically describe what I want NetSH to do. And in this simple JSON file of properties and values, and don't have to read it too close. You can come talk to me about it later. Um, I am going to define that I would like to use NetSH and all of its nastiness that I have to use to mess with the firewalls. And I'd like it to be a nice, simple command like called set win firewall. Are you with me so far? And I've added in a couple of parameters. That's all I've done. Took me all of like two minutes to, to do that. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to export this with Crescendo. Well, it's not exactly the one I wanted to export, but we'll do this. Now over here, change him to What Crescendo just did is it created those mod it created that module, the PSD1 and the PSM1. You with me so far? Here's the best part about modules created by Crescendo. First of all, that just made the commandlet for me. Crescendo did all the work. So if you don't know how to wrap your own API to make your own commandlets, Crescendo just did that for me. It just took care of everything. Here's the best part. This module that Crescendo just made, yes, of course it works on PowerShell 7, but it also works down level to Windows PowerShell 5.1. So Bob. And you. Oh, wait, that was one of the goals of breaking things up into multiple swim lanes of technology. Various swim lanes, various technologies need to run in the, only the latest version of PowerShell, but a bunch of them can go down level, and that's the, the benefit of breaking things up. We can go faster, and they can find a more natural home. Now, I just copied those two modules to my GitHub repository, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get add... Uh, let's go back to single line, thank you, and get commit. 
And I'm going to send this over to Sydney, who's kind of running this whole project on the Windows side. So I'm going to say git push. And I'm going to send this to her repo so that she can try it out to see if the module I just made is going to be useful to Bob. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason, for putting that together. Um, so first things first, let's get to the right spot. Um, there we go. Nice. And then I'm going to do a git. <laughs> Have this all memorized. All right, git pull <laughs> to grab that. Awesome. And now I'm going to import the module. The opaque teleprompter. Cool. And so now I can get using um, this module that Jason created. So I'm going to do set win firewall um, with the off. And it's requiring me to have elevation, Jason. Oops, I screwed up. <laughs> but I know what we can do here. Um, we can use secret management to provide the secret and the password um, and use that to, to get administrative access. So what we'll do um, is use set secret. Uh, I'm going to have my secret name, which is administrator, if I can spell that right. Administrator. Cool. It's going to prompt me for what my secret is so I can provide that. Cool. I think I got that right. Um, got to provide the password for my vault as well. And we are all set. So now I can do run get secret info. Just to make sure that that was clear. So she provided two passwords because one password was to the vault that she's going to put the other passwords in. So that gave you access to that. So if you like have a password manager, you have to have a, a login to your password manager. And then she stored the secret under a name and the password. Exactly. Yeah, thanks so much for explaining that. And I'll also mention, um, if you want to know more about secret management and secret store, secret store is the vault, the local vault that I'm using right now. Um, we'll go into more detail of that in the tool session as well. Um, but for now, I can run get secret info, get my secret metadata. You'll see I created a secret called administrator. It's a secure string, and it's in my PM demo vault, which is exactly where I want it. And with that, I will hand things back over to Jason. <laughs> thanks, Sydney. So here's the idea. She set up secret management. Now, like she said, you want the details on secret management. This is a great vault for you to use so you don't have to put passwords into your scripts, all that kind of stuff. Yes? yes. OK, OK. Yeah, yeah. So, Never put passwords in your scripts. So here's the deal. Now, I need to add, oh my, I need to add, thank you, sir. I think maybe, let's see here. Cool. So what I'm going to do is, uh, let me just show you this real quick is dun, 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 dun. So what I'm going to do is this, is I'm going to modify my Crescendo JSON file for elevation. Crescendo supports elevations because a lot of your commands will need it. So in this case, I'm going to use elevation. I put in the full length line. This can be shortened up quite a bit, but we can add elevation to Crescendo. I'm going to tell it to basically add a dash credential onto anything that I create. And here's where it's going to supply, administrator, and get secret. It's going to grab the secret from the vault so that passwords don't have to be exposed. Now, the best part about this is, is I'm just going to export this once again. Let me grab export this one. And I'll copy it once again. So I think somebody on Twitter was complaining about PowerShell needs a sudo. Well, Crescendo actually understands this notion implicitly. Get add. Let me just give this. And I'm going to send this back over to Sydney so that she can try this and see if this fixed the problem. Good luck. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Let's do that. All right, so we're going to um, get pull here. Looks great. Um, I am going to do a quick remove module, win firewall, and then import. There we go. And now let's try that command again. So we had set win firewall off. 
And okay, it works, yay! <laughs> So just to make sure you saw, understood what you saw. So um, she took the secret, stored it in a vault, and then modified Crescendo to say, when you run this, go grab that secret from the vault and use, uh, run an escalated mode. So happy days. Woo. And with that, I'll pass things over to Danny, who's going to show us how we can deploy this. Thank you. All right. So go to the mic. Oh, oh, yes, thank wee, you. Wee. Great, so now back on Mac, how do I take this module that we've created and deploy that to all my other machines? And so with PowerShell 7, I can use PowerShell remoting over, uh, over SSH. And so with SSH natively on Unix machines, as well as uh, Win32 OpenSSH on Windows machines, I can hit all my different nodes, no matter what the OS is. And so here, I'm just gonna do a dollar sign, uh, new PS session, I think this is the one I want. That's Great. Enter, put in my password. All right, great. And so now I can just do a copy item, uh, not that one. And so we'll just put, uh, yeah, F2. It's, the, it's like the non-physical F2. I was like, where'd it go? That's just the normal two. Um, great, and so I'm gonna just grab my uh, two session and hit enter. Oops. I just wanna point out what Danny's doing over remoting and SSH. He's doing a deployment by using copy item. So when you're thinking about deployments, yes, you can use complicated software that does complicated things for your complicated environment. But if you don't need the complication, why not just use copy item? Mm -hmm. It does it to your remoting sessions. It's like the easiest tool in the world to use for deployments. I've been using it for a decade that way. Over SSH to everybody. What? Wait. <laughs> Great. If um, it failed, it failed. It failed. It's okay. Great. Jason's demo, not mine. It's fine. Yeah, take this. We're we're good. We're Great. good. But the kind of the key point, yeah, here is, if I want to do anything over SSH, it's easy to set up on with PowerShell remoting. If you're if you have systems where you don't even have PowerShell running and you want to go and execute something, if it is a native command, you can do that still using PowerShell remoting or, or an SSH session directly from PowerShell. Yeah, and you're going to talk all about oh, this yes. in your session today. If you'd like to know more about SSH, come to the session today at 3. <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey can take us. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, glad you could. Uh... Oh, oh, actually, so I'm sorry, sir, to interrupt. Yeah. What? I, um, actually, actually, um, to be honest, sir, uh, I, I forgot. I have one more thing. One more thing. So. We did a little bit of work to see if we could do something special for the conference and for you folks. So we haven't officially announced this. This is the official announcement. But just for you folks, we just opened up a brand new predictor as a PowerShell completer that is available for you to use with PS Reline's predictive IntelliSense. Dongbo Wang is the lead engineer working on this. And we put it up. It's an experiment to see what you think. So here's the repo, it's open for you. And it's all open sourced. We look forward to your conversations and additional plugins from there. How's that, is that cool? Hey. All right, Jeffrey, you Ac Actually, Jason, actually, what? actually, Jason, we have one more thing. We actually also have open sourced our Unix tab completers repo. Um, this is PowerShell parameter completers for native commands on Linux and Mac OS. Very exciting announcement. Um, so I guess with that. Yeah, I, I still got something too. <laughs> We've, uh, we have the new get what's new commandlet. So we talked about the velocity of, that we, of the new things that we ship over the last three or 60 new releases uh, of uh, PowerShell either stable or, or preview. And so if you want to know what's new, just run get what's new. And you can thank Sean Wheeler, wherever he is, for the help in putting that together. So talk to Sean. Thanks, folks. Oh, oh, wait, wait. One, one more thing. You might have remembered uh, four or five or 17 years ago, we said we were going to open source DSC. Uh, well, finally, we got to it. Sorry, there's been some issues there, uh, but we now, DSC v3 beta 1 is now available on GitHub. 
So I, I just saw everybody raise their phones. Um, if you are a fan of DSC, I want to point out, Gail, where are you? Okay, there's Gail Colas. He runs or helps run the DSC community. And I just want to say, this is something that Gail and I have just hoped for. It's something that Michael Green promised everybody five years ago. Wow. And he has been tenacious. He has not stopped calling me on the phone, all of this stuff. We eventually got it open source. So we'll officially announce this in a couple of weeks from the team. But to you guys, we've open sourced DSC and Gail. We got a lot of work to do, bro. So, <laughs> but in other words, that's awesome. That's, yes. Come on, guys. That's awesome. That's awesome. So again, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the conference. This really is a great opportunity for you to connect with your fellow practitioners, with your speakers, and uh, develop that community that can, can really uh, just pay rewards over and over again. So lots of ways to stay in touch with us. Uh, there's the PowerShell GitHub. We have a PowerShell community call. This is your opportunity to come hear what it is that we're working on, uh, voice your opinion, bring up your concerns. Again, PowerShell is no longer Microsoft's thing. It is the community's thing. Okay, we lead the community, but it really is a community thing. Uh, we've got the team blog and of course the, the PM, uh, sorry, the PowerShell Twitter on uh, PowerShell team. And add Danny's session tool? What the hell is that? Is that like a to-do?